want to welcome all our viewers to the latest episode of uh, Cops and Convicts uh, with Sean Shepard. I'm Sean Shepard. And just want to remind all our viewers to hit that subscribe button, hit that uh, thumbs up button for your guy that uh, increases our visibility on, on, the, on the web. And I want to introduce a very good friend of mine. Spent many years in law enforcement, Miguel Rosario. Uh, we met in San Diego. Miguel, salud. Saludos. Yeah, man. Welcome to Cops and Convicts, brother. Um, Thank you, Sean. Let's start at the beginning, bro. T tell, tell everybody where you're from. I know where you're from. Say it loud and proud, bro. <laughs> <laughs> South Bronx, New York. South Bronx, New York, born and raised. Uh, March 12, 1958. Um, Grew up in a uh, very rough area, but I didn't know it was rough at the time because when you bro uh, when you are raised in that environment, uh, life is normal. Um, so you know, although there was a lot of drugs, drug addicts, crime, gangs, and things like that, uh, my mom and dad did a great job of protecting us, uh, keeping us off the street. And, uh, and then you learn, you learn how to survive, you know, you learn the little tricks of survival. Um, so it wasn't, it was a good upbringing. It really was. I, I value highly uh, that upbringing. So you have brothers and sisters? Yes. I have uh, three brothers and a sister. And are you the only one of your siblings that got into law enforcement? Uh, no. Um, my, I'm the oldest, uh, brother number three. Angel also um, uh, joined law enforcement. And the funny part about this is, and I'm very proud of this fact, um, of us four, all of us served in defense of our country, uh, two Marines and two Coast Guardsmen, uh, as did many uncles on both sides of the family. And then uh, Angel, pretty much, um, I joined the Marine Corps, and he joined the Marine Corps later uh, when he graduated. And then I joined the San Diego Police Department in 1979, and then when he got out of the Marine Corps, he joined the San Diego Police Department. So, um, you know, we had that little, you know, I went first, and then he came right after me. So the the Marines is what got you out to San Diego? The No, the Marines is what got me out of New York. Uh, I was actually in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, I was an infantryman, and I was uh, in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, uh, but I applied to San Diego PD... Uh, when my ex-wife's uncle, just on a whim, on a phone call, told my wife, my then wife, that uh, he had just read in the paper SDPD was hiring. Uh, talk about, you know, what, what are the chances of that happening? Because I was actually applying for NYPD. That's what I always wanted to be was NYPD. Right. So why, why, did, why did you want to go to San Diego PD when your dream was to, to be an NYPD officer? Well, I, I found myself in a position where um, if if I got out of the Marine Corps, because if I applied to NYPD, um, you take the test, the physical test, you take the written test. The problem was back then, 1979, I was told over 50,000 people would take that test annually. And the city was about, I don't know, what, six, seven, eight million people back then. So it was a huge bureaucracy, the red tape. So by the time you they get through all those applications and they, you know, they hire you, it's two or three years down the line. And I had to make a choice whether to re-enlist in the Marine Corps and make it a career or get out and then wait around two or three years for me to get hired. Anything can happen living in New York. Right. You know that, right? Yeah. And then I would probably have to gotten a, you know, some small time job and then, you know, go to school or something. And then all the temptations in New York, I just, I weighed, I weighed all the facts and options I had and SDPD was on a fast track, um, to hire at that time. They needed cops and, uh, there was some affirmative action too, uh, action going on. And so, um, I jumped on board and I got hired pretty quickly. So for for our viewers, since affirmative action is really not a topic that is typically discussed today, affirmative action was put in place to balance out the number of people of color versus 
white people in this work environment because they were lacking in people of color. Um, right now, people are very, very sensitive about, you know, white people not having as many job opportunities. Well, you know, for centuries, the only people who could get a job was white people. And for centuries, there were no people of color or females in the profession of law enforcement. So that was a corrective measure, and it, it is still a corrective measure that's in place to help diversify law enforcement. Absolutely. Right. So I wanted to make that clear to our viewers. What made you join the, the military? You're Puerto Rican from the Bronx. What was it about your childhood, you're in high school, what made you join the military? A couple of things. Um, I had some great role models. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I had uncles on both sides, on my dad's side and my mom's side, who um, served in the military. And um, during that time, those were the heroes. Those heroes that were coming back from Vietnam were seen as heroes uh, among the people I grew up with, and they were seen as role models. Um, although the Vietnam War wasn't going well, and uh, there were a lot of uh, flag draped caskets coming, coming back, and uh, you know, moms were uh, deadly afraid their sons were going to be drafted. Um, I always held a special place for those veterans, um, you know. And there was one particular veteran um, that lived up the block, and he was a role model. And then here's the other thing, uh, out of necessity, um, when I graduated high school, I, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of money. So the best I probably would have been able to do was to maybe go to community college um, and then jump to a four-year college after the two years. But what scared me, to be honest with you, because I always knew I wanted to be a police officer and I knew that I had to stay clean. You know, I couldn't have tickets. I couldn't have warrants. I couldn't, you know, use drugs. And living in New York City at that time, as I got older, I, I became 18, 17, 18, 19. I, I tell you what, it became more difficult to dodge those temptations. And I thought joining the Marine Corps, I could kill a couple of birds with one stone, get out of the city, spend three or four years uh, while I, you know, while I waited to be 21 to come on a police department. And, and maybe travel too. And so um, that's, that's, those are the reasons I did it. So I'm fascinated, Miguel, because I, I speak to, you know, I speak to a lot of members of law, law enforcement. And you may be one of the only people that have said that they've always wanted to be a police officer. Yes. And from what I'm hearing you say, you had some role models in your neighborhood that you looked up to, and that helped inspire you to want to be a police officer, or, or at the very least, join join the military. Yes, join the military because you got to understand, and you know this comes full circle back to the issue of affirmative action. You see, I didn't see a lot of cops when I was growing up that looked like me. Right. Um, but when you're a little kid. You don't see racism. You don't see bias. So those two cops that I used to see on the corner, standing there on the corner, all I saw was blue. And I saw them as these, these, these role models, positive role models, heroes that were out there protecting us and all that. And so, um, you know, plus I got to tell you this. Um, the first time I saw... Two police officers. I can remember it like it happened yesterday. Uh, NYPD, they wear the blue, right? So dark blue with the gold buttons. And I remember it was winter. I was with my dad. I must have been, I don't know, six or seven. And he was holding my hand. <clears throat> we were ready to cross the street. And uh, I see these two cops on the corner standing, you know, ramrod straight. It was cold. So they were wearing uh, what they call those great coats, you know, which is a high collar. Right. All the way down, three-quarter right. length, right? Remember Parker. those? Yeah. And then with the hat, you know, low. And uh, they used to wear these gray. The uniform was blue, but they wore these gray leather gloves that offset that uniform really nicely. And then what was interesting was they had their they had their nightsticks. They had that leather thong string. 
right. tightly around their hands, and they were both standing there with the nightsticks up by their chest, standing side to side. And I remember looking at my dad, and my dad, I could tell my dad admired them. Really? Yeah, I could tell my dad admired them. And you know, what's a kid want to do? You want to be what your dad wants to be. You know, you want to be what, your, what makes your dad happy. And when I saw that those were his heroes, he looked up to them. Because I, I didn't see him look at people like that before. And these are two white cops. These are two white cops. These are probably two Irish cops. The Irish dominated, you know, police work in NYPD for the longest time in the 20s, 30s, and 40s and into the 50s and had a huge influence on, on police, uh, the police profession. But I didn't see that. What I saw was my dad admiring two heroes, two brave heroes standing on that corner. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to be. Mm. And so from that age, that's what I want to be. And the last story I got to tell you is that we saw so much crime. It was rampant where I grew up. And I remember uh, in particular, I used to, we used to watch this one drug addict that lived in the area. His dad owned a grocery store. So the family was a good family. Right, but he was, he was strung out. He was strung out. He, he just happened to go sideways, you know? Right. And he was putting mom and dad through, you know, a lot of suffering because they were good people. They were business people. They owned a little grocery store. They, 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 they worked very hard. But this kid used to steal from everybody. <laughs> I remember seeing him one time. There was a truck, a delivery truck that was driving down the street. He jumped on the back of this truck, opened the door, and emptied that truck out to his friends as the truck is moving. And he's smiling, having a great time. But I also saw that as soon as they spotted the cops, the look of fear came over their faces. And I remember thinking, I love that. I love that when they saw the cops, man, the look of fear came over them because those were the only people they respected and feared. When the cops weren't around, they were bullies, mugging old ladies and mugging the weak. So there was that part of it, to be honest with you also, that appealed to me. You know, I wanted to be that guy that went after those guys and prevented them from hurting your grandma, your mom, that kind of thing. So this dude was committing these crimes in his own neighborhood? In his own neighborhood. His, in fact, it was a neighborhood where his dad had his store. Yeah. Literally on the same block that his dad had the store, his dad was highly respected. Everybody in the block knew his dad. Loved his dad, respected his dad. He was a good man, hardworking man. So you always wanted to become a cop. You get out of the Marines, and you apply to San Diego Police Department, and you get accepted. I do. What were your thoughts of going to this this foreign land? Because you and I both know San Diego and the Bronx are... As far as the East is from the West, culturally. Yes. So you get there. What do you encounter when, when, when you get to San Diego and you go through the academy? What was the academy like? Well, you got to remember one thing, um, and I'll get into it. All I knew about California was what I saw on TV. Right? Me too, right? right? So what else? Sunshine, I, surfing. And Adam 12. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, Remember yeah. Remember Adam 12? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam 12, Dragnet. Right. Okay? So I watched those 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 uh, series on TV as a little kid, and those, those, those series on TV had an effect on me. It influenced me. Because Adam 12, if you, if you for those that, you know, lived in that era, you know what I'm talking about. And for those that are younger, maybe they may not relate to that. Go to YouTube and watch a couple of episodes of Adam 12. Uh, that series portrayed LA cops as professional, sharp, you know, uh, doing good and that kind of thing. It was, it, it was quite captivating. And uh, so when I came out to San Diego, I was coming out to something similar to Adam 12 is what I'm thinking. Okay. You know, it was not LAPD and it was not Adam 12. Talk to me. What, what, what was it? Well, first, 
you know, I'm looking at, you know, the uniform. I'm coming out of the Marine Corps, so uniform's important. In the Marine Corps, um, you wear your uniform with pride, not that the other branches don't, but in the Marine Corps, it is an obsession to wear that uniform with the highest level of pride. You know, you can't even have a little fiber, we we call them Irish pennants, in your clothing, those little fibers that stick out. Right. You know, you'd get shoot out for something like that. Your shoes better be shine. Your brass better be polished. You know, your your grooming had to be sharp. And so uniform was a big thing to me. And I come out to San Diego and we're wearing tan shirts and polyester bell bottom pants. And I'm asking myself, well, wait a minute, what happened to the blue uniform that I watched on TV? But you know, I was so into, you know, joining that exclusive club that, you know, you kind of you kind of push it aside and and you know, you move on. And so you go through the academy. Again, I was used to seeing on TV the academy was very paramilitary, you know, gung ho, like the Marine Corps. And in San Diego, it was very academic based. Yeah, we did a little marching, we did a little bit of push ups. We definitely did PT, but it was a lot more laid back, much more academic centered. Um, and so that was different. That took some getting used to. So when you say a- academic centered, give me an, give me an example of what you mean by that. Um, the one positive thing about SDPD um, that was always the case, and that's why they were they were respected uh, on a national level, is because they graduated um, well prepared police officers from the academy, and so uh, when it came to everything that a cop, the hundreds of hours of training that a cop goes through, um, you were taking uh, many quizzes. Not a week went by where you didn't take ten, twenty mini quizzes and then the main test on any subject um you know um uh, legal uh the law uh policies procedures officer safety uh first aid uh i mean that was really really crammed in your brain and and it was very intense academic um focus so do you feel like they they really prepared you from a knowledge standpoint where if You pulled me over and I said, you know, I know the law and this is the law. You feel like they prepared you for where you knew what the law was and you would either agree with that person or disagree because you knew that you were absolutely right. Today, you get pulled over by police officers. You can tell a lot of them don't know the law. So what I'm hearing from you is you felt like the way they prepared you academically that you knew what the law was. Yes. And um, here's the other thing. They did a good job in the academy. And then when you went into field training, which meant you rode, after you graduated, you rode, uh, there were three phases of uh, four weeks. So that was three months, three phases a month with a field training officer, which was a senior officer who really knew police work. They were selected especially because they knew police work very well and they were good teachers. So it was a vetting process. Um, You got this real thick book. It was called a task book. And every single box in that task, critical task book, a training critical task book, every single box in that book depending on the phase. Of course, first phase, you weren't, you know, uh, expected to go out and make felony arrests. So it it started easy, like, you know, traffic sites, uh, field interview, stopping people and filling out a field interview, um, taking reports, low level reports and easy things like that. Um, taking somebody to to detox for four hours instead of jail. So it was, it, 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 it gradually started to build until your last phase the last couple of weeks of your last phase, you're basically driving and um, your FTO says, make believe I'm not there. You're field gonna field training everything. officer. Yes. FTO. Okay. FTO. Yeah. So you arrive in this environment. 
as part of the affirmative action program. That I never, I got to tell you, Sean, I was never told that. And I never saw it on paper. But? But I knew. And that's okay. I'm proud of that. I am very proud of that. Because here's the other side of that. I know I was qualified. I know I was qualified. Because the way I grew up, my instincts, growing up in New York, my street instincts, okay, that, that the reason I survived in New York is because, and you, you know this because you grew up there, you just learn human nature you look at somebody from across the street and you can tell that person is not desiring anything good for me. Right. You know, I need to keep my eye on this guy. You know, you become a a, a really, really good judge of character. Not always 100% right. Right. But pretty close to, you know, uh, being right a lot right. about people. Right. And so I had those skills. You know, I saw crime everywhere I went living there. And so, you know, I was, I was a pretty good i had a pretty good eye for picking up crime um i was also good with interacting with people and then i had my military training you know the discipline firearms um the leadership in the marine corps and all those things so i know i was qualified i always did good academically because i went to a private school uh, in grammar school in my high school i went to a, a public school but it was a good school um, so i know i was qualified and my attitude was, I don't care how you hire me or why you hire me, just hire me. Right. Because I can do the job. And so um, I'm not ashamed at all to say that I was hired in, in, in an affirmative action program because in a way, the way I see it too, is I was, I was helping out. They wanted to diversify the San Diego Police Department so we could reflect what the community was looking like. The community at that point was pushing back because they just didn't see a lot of that progress happening. They were putting officers who didn't have that cultural um, knowledge uh, into neighborhoods of color, and they weren't doing that well. Not, not all of them, though, because there were a lot of good white cops that, um, for some reason, they got it. I met a lot of good white cops who really got it. They knew how to treat people. And and when they didn't know something, they had a problem culturally, they knew how to, you know, um, um, bridge that gap. And so I, I knew a lot of them, you know, that's why it's hard for me to, to paint a broad brush, paint, you know, any group with a broad brush. But I got to admit though, there were people on the police department, uh, when we weren't too diverse, that just I can say this to you straight up. I knew cops who would not, you know, I ate that separates North San Diego from South San Diego. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. So I ate, there were cops that openly said, I won't work South of I eight because South of I eight is where the neighborhoods of color are. I won't work down there. And what bothered me a little bit was, well, it bothered me quite a bit to be honest with you was, well, wait a minute. You get to say that? You get to dictate where you're going to work? You know what's funny? Neighborhoods of Color would sign up for that in a heartbeat now. Oh, you white cops don't want to come down here? Sign us up. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting yeah. that, that they were, like you said, permitted to say that. Well, a few. A few. Especially the ones that were liked, you know, because everything is about, you know, liking and, you know, part of the good old boys club and stuff like that. Uh, but there were some that, you know, will say, I don't want to go down there. And the PD, when they wanted to, would say, oh, no, 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 no. You don't get to tell us where you're going. We tell you where you're going. And they would send them down there. But then what's their attitude when they get sent down there? Well, exactly. 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 And some of it, you know, some of it was fear. Okay. Um, and this is my opinion, my opinion only. Uh, and I talk to a lot of people. So, you know, I'm not just, you know, pulling this out from nowhere. Um, just put yourself in the shoes of a young white kid whose parents do the right thing to protect their son or daughter. And what do they do? They move to the suburbs. They move to the nice neighborhood, um, good schools, uh, low crime. Nothing wrong with that. That's the American way. But that kid 
what he's missing is interacting as a little kid and growing up with a, in, within a diverse community, which is school, that social interaction, and all they see on TV and in the movies is how people of color are portrayed. Right. And it's negative. Right. And it's violent. And it's nasty. And so that's that kid's reference point. And who's writing those scripts? Right. Right. And so that kid is the kid that is most likely to want to be a cop, just like me. Maybe he had the same reasons I had. Right. But he has anxiety because he's never really been around people of color. It's all the negative um, you know, stereotypes he's seen, been exposed to. And so he gets defensive and he thinks, I don't want to go down there. You know. So yeah, it's 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 kind of complex, you know. It's simple, but it's also complex sometimes when you look at it. Um and, and you know, and that's what you deal with. And there's there's another side of that coin because there's also that profile of officer that you just described where there may be a little different twists and turns that he or she experienced when they grew up. They still lived in that bubble. And for the record, any ethnic bubble that you live in as homogenous, it really is putting you at a disadvantage when it comes to socializing with people. Oh, you bet. Like, like, like if you live in a black bubble, a brown bubble, a white bubble, and that's all the, the, the only bubble you lived in, the way the world works, you typically don't stay in that bubble 100% of the time. Right. Well, when you leave that bubble, you've had, you have a profile of officer that's, that's, that's never been around people of color, but want to go down there and enforce the law. Right. Or their version of the law. Yeah. Because we've had officers come in here and say, you know, they're with LAPD and we got these white officers coming from Idaho and they want to work in, in South Central. What, what do you want to do that for? You've never been around black people before. Why are you so eager to go down there? And I asked her, why do you think they were so eager to, eager to go down there? She said, because they wanted to crack some skulls. That's why they wanted to go down there. Mm -hmm. So you get, to, you get to San Diego Police Department and you are clearly a minority. How are you treated inside of San Diego Police Department that's primarily white and you're a man of color? That's an interesting question. So um, picture me being 21 right out of the Marine Corps. Uh, I got the Marine Corps haircut. I'm um, slim and trim. You steal um, all those things, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little grayer, right? Yeah, man. So... Uh, and I am focused. I am laser focused on um, learning everything I can because I want to get through this academy. I want to get through field training so I could be on my own. And um, and I'm 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 seeing some people failing. You know, um, good people failing. Uh, and I don't want to do that. So I'm very very focused. And so at first I didn't see a whole lot of um, uh, different treatment. But then when I uh, left field training and I was on my own at a patrol division, slowly but surely, I started looking around and there weren't very many Latinos, blacks or Asians or females for that matter. Um, and then you start hearing about, you know, there's some angry people, um, managers at that time, because the feds basically, you know, because of the complaints from the community about the lack of diversity on the police department, um, they wanted to see cops that looked like them in their neighborhoods because they felt, the community felt that they would have a better chance of communicating those officers, black officers, Latinos, Asians, and women of color in those neighborhoods uh, would be able to um, um, interact because of the, you know, they're familiar with those cultures and they feel at ease, they feel at home and that kind of thing. Um, but here's the other side of it. The federal government came in on the complaints of the community 
and basically told SDPD, we've done the numbers, we've run the numbers. You guys need to um, improve in your recruiting, in your retention. You need to bring in more people of color. And so what happens? Most human beings resent being told what to do. Right. So there was there was resentment. You know, what do you mean we we have to take these people? You know, and then you start hearing the quota thing. You know, oh, you just want us to have a quota. And so, um, you know, then there was talk about when we were hired, there was some, I never said it to my face, um, but again, remember, I'm telling you I was focused. So maybe it was said around me, but I didn't pick up on it. I doubt it. I would have probably picked up on it, but I did hear it. I heard people talking on the side about other people of color and you could hear, oh, hey, you know what? He's one of those affirmative action. He's not qualified. They just, what they did was they just brought down the, uh, the standards a little bit, clicked them down so we could hire these people. And I overheard that, you know, imagine how that makes me feel, you know, now defense mechanism to protect myself. So I won't be hurt. My attitude was, well, I'm not one of those because I got my Marine Corps experience and this dude talking this crap's never been in the service, never served his country. So I ain't going to listen to what he says. He's an idiot. You know, I mean, I didn't say that openly because I was still new on probation. I'm not going to get fired for say, saying something like that. Um, but I felt it. And, uh, but here's the thing that's interesting too. That resentment through word of mouth became, because uh, of course there's not going to be a policy because the feds are watching. So Were they under con consent decree? I don't think that SDPD ever got to that point because uh, the, the administration understood uh, what was on the line and they didn't want to, um, be under consent decree. So uh, they took measures to uh, to get it done. Uh, but that meant bringing those numbers up and bringing them up pretty quickly. Right. The government didn't want, the feds didn't want any excuses like other departments. And that's those departments that gave excuses and, and pushed back and pushed back thinking they could ended up being under consent decree. And that wasn't good because the first thing that went was... Um, most police departments um, receive uh, huge grants, federal grants for equipment, um, and that's huge. Most cities, it's expensive to uh, it's expensive to run a police department for any city. Right, it's probably one of their biggest budget, um, you know, um, outlays. Uh, so when the feds can, you know, come in with thousands of dollars for equipment and training and things like that, you know, you don't want to have that taken away from you because you'll be hurting. And then that chief's got to answer up because the mayor's calling him in or her in and saying, Hey, what's up with your numbers? You know, so there's pressure, but here's the thing that really bothered me was that there was a word of mouth that we have to hire them. We don't have to keep them, which meant if you start seeing this person struggling, do your best to talk them into, um, you know, resigning. And if we have to, we'll fire them. Um, now, truth be told, there were a lot of, and I felt bad for them. I was lucky because I went to a private school, so my reading skills and my writing skills were pretty decent. Right. You know, when you got a nun standing over you with a ruler getting ready to go upside your head, you learn how to spell and you learn how to read pretty good. That was, that was, I went to Catholic school too. <laughs> St. Luke's in the Bronx. Yeah. So I got a t-shirt that says I survived St. Luke's, but uh, I was lucky. I was fortunate. In, in more than one way. Yeah. In a now, few ways. You know, now that we, you know, years later we find out survival has a whole different meaning. And I didn't, man, I wasn't even hip to that back then, man. I was an altar boy and everything, man. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I just, you know, count my blessings that there was some good priests, man. Right. Me too. But we were vulnerable, weren't we? Now that we look back. Hey, we were alone with priests all the time, yeah, man. And yeah. I, I, I remember I had a priest come into my my house. I had, I had watched Amityville Horror, that movie. The I was, first one. I was freaked out by that, and I had Father Bob come to my house and into my room, and bless the room. Oh wow! No, nothing happened, right? You you know, but you think about it. That that could have been a there. perfect opportunity for him to to have done something, but. He'd have caught a bad one from me if he would have tried. 
We um, <laughs> you know, we have Father Charles, and Father Charles from St. Luke's uh, was a kind man. And what he did was he had family upstate, and he would go around to different families. And you know, like with me, he he would he would go to my mom and go, "Hey, can Miguel go up with me to visit my family up in you know uh, upstate New York? It's about an hour and a half ride each way." And my mom, you know, it's like, "Oh yeah," and I look back now, wow. Thank God, you know, nothing bad happened. They were good. They were good. We we got lucky with, with good people. Yeah, he was a good priest. He yeah. was a good man. Yeah, and his family, you know, treated me good when we got there. They were they were just very kind. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, we were vulnerable. So you were you 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 felt like your your military career and your academic background prepared you to be a legitimate cop. You could you you felt like you could stack up against anybody, even at age twenty one. No doubt. Um, and, you know, you, you realize one thing. You know, when you're 21, even with, you know, with that background, you realize, man, there's some good cops out here, man, that got five, 10 years on. And, man, they're good. They're really good. They can spot crime. They can write good reports, man. They can do good interviews, interrogations. Um, they're just good, good cops. You know, they serve the community very well at a high level. And it takes years for you to get to that level. So, you know, I was confident, but I was also, you know, humble confident because I had so much to learn. But one of the dynamics I, I, I wanted to tell you was the dynamic of when you have, you know, a culture pushing back on something like affirmative action. And then you have these things like, you know, we have to hire and we ain't got to keep them. Wink, wink to the field training officers. Um, and by the way, I had a couple, I had many Latino friends who told me that they were told in field training because they were having problems doing reports. And they would tell them, they would tell them, hey, pal, you know, you're a nice guy and I like you, but you know what? Your reports are bad, man. And, you know, I've tried to help you and you. I know you're working hard, but it ain't happening. And, you know, if you still want to be a cop, it's probably a good idea for you to resign and take up a couple courses, learn how to write reports, you know, write better, and then then you can hire on again. But if we fire you, you're done. Nobody's going to hire you. And that was kind of like the secret, you know, the secret wink, wink that I surmise they came up with to tell guys. And so for those that listen to this and think, oh, man, you know, that's not true. Believe me, one of my good friends that happened to went to Border Patrol and ended up retiring as an assistant chief. And I, I spoke to several others who went through the same thing, hmm. the same exact pattern. I saw the pattern. We talked about the pattern, you know. Um, so that was, that was sad. And then what happened was that kind of uh, encouraged what I'm about to tell you, which is even within the black officers, the Latino officers, and the Asian officers, we started kind of going at each other too, because it was it was one of those things, you know, uh, um, survival of the the fittest. And so, I started seeing those Latino cops. I could talk about the Latino cops because I was more, you know, um, uh, I paid more attention to. Latino cops because we hung out together more and um, the Latino cops that really didn't speak English or admitted to and were maybe lighter skin and were accepted quicker tended to look down at the Latinos who were a little darker and you know were confident in their identity and let me tell you man I'm Puerto Rican and our identity is solid man we know who we are and we don't make no excuses and then remember I'm Puerto Rican. I'm in a Mexican right. town. Yeah, you know, but thank God, man. Out of out of ten Mexican officers, eight or nine treated me wonderful. But every once in a while, I'd have that guy who was raised in the in the region, never been in the military, never was exposed to other cultures, and he looked down. He looked down. And I, I, you know, and I felt the resentment and I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, man, we're in the same boat <laughs> rowing without an oar 
And here you are acting like, you know, you're a little better or something like that. So, but you get, you get past that. So do you feel like because of this program, um, this effort to diversify the department at that time where you had some black officers, some Asian officers, some Latino officers, some female officers, and, and, and they're in a whole different food group. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right? Do you feel like your explanation for, you just said the groups would go at each other. Were they trying to distinguish themselves as the best minority group? In like, some cases, like what yes. Is it, like what, what do you think the nature of that was, like some of the nature of that was? I call it, the, um, there were some people that maybe didn't have that strong identity of who they were, and, and they felt, they could see that being Latino was looked down upon by the majority right, right group. Because it's with everything, it's in-group, out-group. The in-group, to be cool, you know, you got to be the majority, right? And if you're not the majority, you're on the out-group. Yeah, man. And everybody's fighting to be on the in-group. That's why I don't do well with any group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't do well with any Me group. Either. I'm not trying to be in any group. Me either. But, but that's part of the culture, though, right? Yeah. That's part of the culture, and you don't have a choice. And so uh, what you get is you got those <laughs> minority officers who felt the pressure to want to be in the in-group and the in-group meant that you didn't act like you were mad when you heard the majority group talking bad about minorities. You would laugh along with them, you know? <laughs> Until you wasn't there and they were talking about you. Right, exactly. Yeah. But they didn't see that. Right. Just as they didn't see the the, the value of their, their identity, their Latino identity. Right. Okay? And my attitude is I'm Puerto Rican. I'm an American first, born and raised here, served my country. But I can't deny my culture. And I always learned since I was a little kid, you're Puerto Rican, man, be proud of that. You know, that's why you see Puerto Ricans. We, our flag is, you know, we're, we're obsessed with it. We're fanatics. But that helps us to cope because we know who we are. And so I was in a better position to cope with the, you know, the, the all of the, how would you call it, um, the bad things from affirmative action. So affirmative action, in theory, was supposed to help, right? But the way it was applied, sometimes it made it worse because it pit us against each other. You know, it pitted, it pitted color against color, race against race, and that kind of thing. And, and, and so it, it, it kind of backfired in a way. It really backfired in a way. I don't know what the answer is, but... I think with more thought and bringing people in to collaborate, uh, I think that would have been better instead of trying to force that down the throat. I, I, I know what the answer is. How about you just not discriminate in the first place? Yeah. Right? So, so look at historically black colleges and universities. There are people alive today that don't know why those schools exist. They exist because black people were not permitted to go to normal universities. They had to create their own, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, how about you just be a good human being so that that doesn't have to happen in the, per yes. in the first place? But you know, here's the thing though. Um, that, that black university having to be established tells you that there was an issue that wasn't addressed, right? Multiple. Yes, and so that's the legacy of when you don't do the right thing and you think everything's going to be peachy, let's just bury it, let it percolate underneath the surface, you know, um, and everything's going to be fine. No, it's not going to be fine. Just like if you and I are friends and we have a falling out and we act, we pretend like everything's going to be fine, let's just not talk about it. No, it's not going to be fine until we sit down as friends and it's not going to be easy. It may be ugly, but if we sit, if we're really friends and we care about each other, and that I think that's the deal is, do we care about each other? Do we value each other? Do we want the best for each other? Then we sit there and we hash that out. Even if we got to come back a couple of days in a row or something like that, it's, you know, it, it makes sense to me. But when you t when you talk about coping, 
now you're not, now you're talking about m- mental health. You're talking about what you had to do mentally as an officer of color, not just you, Asian cops, black cops, and then then take color out of it, the female cops. To step into this historically all white environment, just want to do a job. And you have to deal with making these mental adjustments to not only survive in this environment that you just shared that they were trying to convince you to leave. We have to hire them, but we don't have to keep them. Right. Right. Word of mouth. So I need people to understand that are watching that That added element of stress is part of the reason when you talk about life expectancy, you know, blood pressure, right, right, diabetes, right, right. So you have to put on this mental armor every day that you're either conscious of and at some point you become unconscious of it because you're doing it every day after day after day and it compounds and it can affect the job that you're doing at work, it could affect your life at home. Yes, relationships, marriages. Yeah. Right. You know, I I saw this. On on top of Miguel, all the crap that you have to deal with doing police work. Which is dangerous. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I I read this, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and it it just floored me because it, it succinctly put everything into context with just a few words and and this was the quote um people of color are a walking defense mechanism the reason i related to that is because my first couple of years in the police department i realized i was a walking defense mechanism uh because i had to i had to come in every day do my work be a try to be a good police officer. Learn to be a good police officer, um, while also working within a culture that, although honorable overall, right, and a lot of good people, the good people outweighed the bad and the ignorant. But that didn't take away from some of the things you heard and and were exposed to. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was it was difficult. Um, you know, I don't know if I do this again as a de- defense mechanism um, to keep myself um, sane and to move forward and to be positive because I like to be happy. But I used to always say to myself that this ain't cool. I don't like it, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen like this, and it ain't right. But every time I get past this and I get promoted or I go to a good assignment. I just learned something. I learned how to survive, and that makes me stronger. What I didn't like, though, is that was okay for me, but how about the two, three guys behind me that had to go through that when they shouldn't? Right. You know, And that's one of the reasons I, I decided to promote is because if I promoted, then I could change it. I could change a little bit, a little part of that. You know what I mean? Where I, I ended up being a captain on the police department and I had a division. I had a patrol division. So at least that division, we were going to do the right thing in that division. You know, and, and by the time I, I uh, retired, there were more captains like me. A lot more captains like me of all colors, white, black, Asians, uh, women, uh, Hispanic. And so I felt good. We had made some progress. Were we there? No, we weren't there. And, you know, and I think there's still some progress that has, has to be made, obviously. Yeah, you, everyone, you, you're watching Cops and Convicts with Sean Shepard. My guest today is retired San Diego police officer Miguel Rosario. Um, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up button for your guy. Miguel, you just said you promoted and made it to the rank of, of captain. Is that the highest you ever made it? 
on the San Diego Police Department, right. um, uh, I ended up um, after retiring from the San Diego Police Department because I didn't know how to retire. Um, I say that half jokingly. Uh, going over to the San Diego District Attorney's Office as an assistant chief of the Bureau of Investigations, and ultimately I became the uh, chief investigator or the chief of the Bureau of Investigations there at the uh, San Diego County District Attorney's Office. So. Tell our viewers what it took for you to promote to captain. What did you what steps did you have to take? What what benchmarks did you have to reach before you were even eligible to become because there's some steps you had to take before you became a captain. Yes. Sergeant, lieutenant, right? Right. So uh -huh. explain those steps. And then tell me about the experience that you had to have in order to go over and work in the Bureau of Investigations. Okay, uh, so to even qualify for sergeant on the San Diego Police Department, you had to at least have four years of service. Okay. Of, uh, of law enforcement service with the San Diego Police Department as a sworn officer. Uh, only then were you qualified. And then you had to have good performance ratings and a recommendation from your command. Did you see anybody bypass that like get promoted before four years um no but it, it was rare for you to get promoted at f four years so it, that was the minimum that was the minimum right and few people made it on the first time around okay okay um in fact i didn't put in for it till i had 12 years on really yeah because i i grew i'm old school man i grew up thinking i was trained both at home and then in school and with my role models. One of my role models was a Vietnam vet, and he, he, he talked about the Army all the time. And, I, and then in the Marine Corps, you hit every rung in that ladder because when you hit every rung, you spent enough time there and you learn your job very well. Right. But when you skip rungs, it becomes more difficult for you to be really good at what you do. So you were a patrol officer for 12 years? No. I was a patrol about seven years. Seven years of patrol officer. Including SWAT. Okay. I was on the SWAT team. I was on the sniper team. And I was also on the special response team, which was like a hostage rescue full-time team. There's only 10 officers out of 70 officers. We had 80 officers, SWAT officers, part-time. SRT was a full-time hand-picked of the very best SWAT officers, tactically, physically, the whole thing. And so I was on that team for a couple of years. Our specialty was hostage rescue um, type of things. We trained with the FBI um, on hostage rescues and that kind of thing. A lot of fun. Loved it. Uh, and then I went to investigations. I became a detective. And I went to the gang unit, narcotics, and special investigations unit. So this was after the seven years as a patrol officer? Yeah, seven, almost eight years. So, so then you put in to become a detective? Yes. Okay. So you're a detective. Yes. For how many? Same, same thing. You know, there's, you got to uh, spend so much time in patrol, um, good performance evaluations, and then you got to get a push from your command from patrol to put in for detectives. It's an interview process. And then if you do well in the interview, you'll put on a list and then they go down the list and pick you up. So you go from patrol officer to detective. And how long do you remain a detective? I remained a detective uh, for about five years, five, six years. So that's 12, that's 12 total. Right. And then only then did I put in for sergeant um, because I felt, hey, you know, I got patrol, I got investigations. Um, I have enough experience that I could, to me, a leader, a sergeant is a, is a, is a teacher, is a coach. You know, it's not about giving orders or the, or the perks of the rank. Uh, some people feel that way. I never did. Because my, I was lucky. I had some sergeants that were coaches, and they were they were teachers, and that's what really a leader. The first level leader is a teacher. Based on all the exposure I've had to law enforcement, I feel like the sergeants are the chiefs of the patrol officers. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The like sergeants, that's your, that's your chief. Great influencer, right? influencers, because they are the role models. They are, that's, that's the person that that officer sees every time they come to work. 
And they're watching how you walk, how you talk, how you interact internally, externally. And they, they're going to follow. They're going to kind of emulate that. And so imagine if you have a sergeant who doesn't teach and is a jerk and is disrespectful, um, blows people off, and then goes in the field and treats community people that way too. You know, that's, they're teaching all right, but they're teaching the wrong things and they're creating that negative influence on so many cops. A couple years ago, and I won't name the agency because I don't like doing that. There was an agency where they caught a couple of cops on duty committing burglaries. You told me about this. I told you that story, right? You did. You did. So they caught, they caught, they had this series of burglaries commercial. So it was stores. And what they found out what the, these cops were doing was they were actually throwing rocks through the window, right? Alarm would go off. They would get dispatched. They would go there. And by the way, the rock that they throw through the window is a store where they, they want something from in there. So they throw a rock through that window. They see like a stereo store. Right. Hey, there's some nice stereo equipment. Throw a rock through it. Alarm goes off. They get dispatched. They go in. They steal stereos and stuff like that. This went on for a while. They got caught. And what did they find out in interviewing those cops, internal affairs? There was one sergeant on one shift. No burglaries went down when that sergeant was working. When the other sergeant was on. It was happening. So they asked the officers, why didn't you steal when, you know, Sergeant Smith was working? Why didn't you guys do those burglaries? And they said, oh, no, nah, man. <laughs> He wasn't going to put up with that. That dude is hardcore, man. He's by the book. He's sharp. He doesn't play around, man. We we knew we, we couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. But it was okay with this guy, huh? Well, yeah, you know, he came to work and, you know, he did line up and then he told us to go in the field and then you didn't see him and stuff like that. So, oh, that sergeant is critical. Critical. So you become a sergeant. You become a coach and a teacher. And how long do you remain a sergeant before you put in to become lieutenant? I was a sergeant for about another six or seven years. So now we're talking, you're at 18, 19 years in at San Diego Police Department. You have your, de you have your detective background because without it, you would not have been able to go over to the DA's office, correct? Exactly. Right. So, yes. so for our viewers, in order to become... An agent, no, what's the, what's the right word for Bureau of Investigations? District Attorney Investigator, right. DAI. Right, right. In order to become an investigator, you, have, you first have had to have detective work in your background with a police department. Before. Absolutely. You can't even apply without it. That's right. All right, That's so right. you're a lieutenant, and your job is now to oversee a sergeant and a group of officers several sergeants and different uh several squads yeah okay so each sergeant oversees a squad right 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 so those sergeants all report to you yes for a shift so i might have i might have a shift i have day watch for example and i might have three or four depending on the division size like mid cities where i started as a lieutenant and I think I had four sergeants, four squads to cover the service area and the shift that I covered. Um, so, you know, yeah, four sergeants and maybe each squad is about eight, 10 officers, you know, so do the math. So, so because you have this paramilitary structure, if a patrol officer has a, a problem with another officer, he or she has to go to their sergeant. Yes. Right? Yes. You can't just go to the captain. You're not supposed to. Right. You're not supposed to. You can't just go to the chief. You're culturally. Culturally, right. you're not supposed to. Right. Yeah. But you're supposed to go to your sergeant. Right. Well, if that sergeant decides, I'm killing this. Like, this is a legitimate complaint. But I like Jim. That complaint could die with that sergeant. Is 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 that is that an accurate statement? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that patrol officer, where's the quality assurance in law enforcement? I made this complaint. Six months has passed. Nothing's been done. What are that officer's options at that point? Well, it's changed. When I came on in 79, that was it. That was it. Unless you wanted to take um, a chance at jumping the chain of command and going to the lieutenant or the captain, and then there was probably, you know, um, a consequence to that. You got a target on your back now. Yeah. At least one sergeant doesn't like you, and he's going to tell two or three other sergeants. Um, so even if you're right, you know, you win the, the battle, you lose the war uh, kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I got to tell you this. Um, I rarely saw that happening. Right. It happened every once in a while. Um, but, you know, there were enough good people that um, if you were a good officer and um, and they saw that you were an honest guy and you were a straight shooter and a hard worker, um, it didn't happen that often. But it did. Ha it happened. It did happen. I want to backtrack for a, a bit, Miguel, because... You talked about how, from a, an ethnic standpoint, a racial standpoint, that, you know, you spent time with Latino officers because you were Latino. Black officers clicked up. Asian sure. officers clicked up. That's another byproduct of this. Right. Well, you know what that sounds like to me? Prison. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Right? Yeah. So, you go to prison... Especially state prison, because I'm, I'm, I'm learning that there's a huge difference between federal prison and state prison. State prison, you don't want to be there. Yeah. Right? No doubt. So you Especially go to- in California. Right. You go to state prison, and in order to survive, you have to get with your ethnic group. That's right. Right? That's right. And in prison, that's survival. This is a different type of survival that we're talking about. We're talking about- keeping alive your ability to be gamefully employed. Right. I would call it, instead of survival, it's a much lower level of survival, and I would call it support. Coping. So so yeah. um, this is where I'm going with this. Yeah. Many of our viewers do not know that at an agency like the San Diego Police Department, or LAPD, where we're at right now in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the police officers' union, that is generally speaking about the overall union, which is primarily white, where you pay your dues to. But then... There's the Black Police Officers Association. Yeah. There's the Latino Police Officers Association. There's the Asian Police Officers Association. There's the Female Police Officers Association. LGBT. I see. I didn't know. I didn't. I, I should oh, yeah. have known that. That now there's the LGBTQ Police oh. Officers oh, yeah. Association. Now, absolutely right. So, talk to me from your perspective and your opinion. What is that about when you've got these? I don't want to use the word segregated, but you're not in the bubble. So you got the you got the police department bubble, but then there's these little bubbles inside of the department. What are those ethnic, gender, uh, sexual preference, police officer associations for, in your opinion? What is, what is that for? They were, and I can tell you from firsthand because I was part of the Latino Police Officers Association, LPOA. What is that? What, why was that formed? That was formed because, I don't know whether you know this, but there was actually a Latino on the San Diego Police Department at the turn of the century, and he became a sergeant. There weren't very many, you know... Obviously. After that, right? Right. And there was a black, there were some black officers in the 30s, I believe. That Hispanic sergeant, his name was Cota, C-O-T-A. And in fact, 
it, I, it just occurred to me, I just remembered that actually the first chief of police for San Diego PD was a man by the name of Gonzalez. The first ever. The first ever. But the problem was because of the record keeping and some of the issues with race, he wasn't given that credit. But I do have a photo of him, and it actually showed up in our albums, and, and our association uh, uh, does acknowledge it. But this happened when we finally, you know, we were to the point where, you know, you start talking about, we got to come clean with some of these things, right? So it's funny because if you look at the, the, the official record, you'll see all the chiefs of police and you don't see Gonzalez, but then in other circles, you'll see Gonzalez in there because he was, he was the chief. So anyway, these associations, from my perspective, what, what was happening was this. When affirmative action first happened, probably in the mid-60s, late-60s, the first round, the first couple of generation of officers of color who were hired, they were scared to death because, you know, they're facing all this. It's their first time, okay? Maybe a number of them don't have college degrees. Um, maybe people of color go to inferior schools. So the educational level is not as high. But because of that anger over the affirmative action and the pushback, they're greeted not so warmly, but they're just happy to have a job. Right. They just want to learn how to be a police officer and go on the street. Okay, so there's no pushback. But then fast forward five or ten years, about the time I start coming on, okay, you don't have this quiet group of people anymore. Now you're starting to get people like me and others that have military service, went to pretty decent school. I went to night school to get my AA and my bachelor's degree and worked on a master's as well. And, and there were many others that were starting to come on with these degrees. And so when we were called in and told, son, you didn't make detective because, you know, um, you don't have a degree, you don't have this, you don't have that. They got away with that the first couple of generations of minorities, but they weren't getting away with it now because we knew, no, that's not the case anymore. Well, what was fascinating to me is that you you know as well as I do that there were officers being promoted to detective and whatever else, and they didn't have their degree either. No. They just happened to not be an officer of color. That's right. And so, you know, I, I heard a, 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 a military general uh, recently, uh, they asked him, you know, why is there still this issue of race in uh, the military and why do the top commanders, they're not doing anything about it. They're still selecting people who look like them. And his answer was, he goes, you know why? Because ducks pick ducks. They do. Right? But here's my, here's my thing to, you know, I heard that and it made logical sense to me which was, was his point. He was trying to be straight up. Here's the problem. That's not an excuse. My attitude is, okay, ducks pick ducks, but you're a military officer or you're a law enforcement high-ranking officer, okay? You got to get past that duck. It's okay for ducks to pick ducks. I have a responsibility now to be smarter about that and to understand the, uh, the value of diversity of having a diverse workplace. But that's not that's not law enforcement culture. Well, it's not. It's not, but I my attitude has always been because I saw it firsthand. It starts at the very top. Right. And all the shot callers, all the decision makers from captain on up because on most police departments, captain on up are the critical shot callers that can change this. Those are the critical, like the sergeant is the critical shot caller for influencing young cops and keeping senior cops on the straight and narrow, right? Because they, they're the enforcers and the influencers and the teachers. But you get to be about a captain, you know, now you have the power to fire and hire and above. And, you know, that's where I think it gets mucked up is that we don't have critical mass 
of like-minded people who see the big picture and the value of diversity without using the excuse that, you know, oh, we're just diversifying to appease people and for affirmative action, and these people are not qualified. That's, that is, that's not the truth anymore. You know, nobody ever said that we need to hire and promote people that are not qualified. Nobody ever said that. You know, we realize you got to be qualified. You know, I don't want somebody who's unqualified sitting next to me in a police car. Well, think about the first police officer. How qualified was he? Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Truth be known, check this out. On, on our department, the most decorated detective, he was a great, great cop, great detective. Um, he ended up passing away. But I'm told this gentleman couldn't write a report when he first came on if his life depended on it. But you know what happened? He became qualified. Somebody <laughs> right. saw some value in that guy. Right. And helped him. Right. And look, he became the most decorated detective ever on our police department. And so if they could do it for him, they could do it for somebody else. You know, now let, uh, this has got to be said too. Were there, were there people of color that maybe passed tests and got on and weren't qualified? Yeah, just like this, white officers, same thing pass all the tests and came on and it just wasn't for them. They didn't have the capacity to do the job. The job's not for everybody. The job is not for everybody. It really isn't, you know, but when it becomes a pattern and when internally other cops see that pattern, that's when it's a problem. So Miguel, you become captain and when you retire, when you leave the San Diego Police Department to go over to the, to B the Bureau of Investigations inside the DA's office, how many years had you been with SDPD total? About four months shy of 34. Okay, so 33 and some change. We are living in a time right now where law enforcement has never been under the microscope that it is under now. No doubt. In the 33 years that you were a police officer, and let's 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 keep it 100. Like San Diego is not L.A. San Diego is not New York, but it's part of the law enforcement community, seventh or eighth largest city in the country. What are some of the top issues that you see inside of law enforcement that need to be addressed so that there is finally trust. I'm not going to say restored because in, in some communities, there's never been trust between the residents and law enforcement. You also just mentioned this profession isn't for everybody. And yet you got people who've been in the, in the profession for years and you find they do something wrong. You find out what their track record is and say, how, how did this, how is this permitted to continue? If this, I'm looking at this person's background, he or she clearly is not cut out for this profession, and yet they remain. Talk to our viewers about some of the top problems that you see inside the profession, and then we can spend some time talking about potential solutions to those problems, because I know that you have a curriculum. I remember your curriculum. You see officers as guardians. Right. Right? Let's talk about some of the problems, and then we'll have some time to talk about your guardian curriculum. Talk to yeah. us about some of the problems inside of law enforcement that you saw over 33 years. Well, I, I, I think that everything starts with leadership and ends with leadership, um, and I saw that firsthand as I went up through the ranks. It starts at the top, and it rolls downhill. And so a city hires a chief that gets it. And that chief has the right vision, uh, the right meaning and purpose where he can articulate those things. And he can stand in front of people, officers, and say, hey, look, these are my expectations. You're a servant. You're a guardian. You're not a soldier. Don't mind me. 
do the right thing always like somebody watching and this i say that before the cameras right okay but that's what they used to tell us and i believed in that do things like somebody's watching because that arrest report you wrote could end up in the, in the supreme court and you're going to look pretty bad if you weren't straight up or you wrote a bad report or you lied or anything like that so um do the right thing tell the truth be honest um lie cheat or steal were the three things i was told from day one lie cheat or steal you're out however today we have what's called the brady list the da's office and it has officers who haven't been truthful my question has always been why do we have a list when you lie you out you lie, you're out. So the Brady list is filled with the names of officers who have been caught lying. Untruthful. Yeah. The problem is, in some cases, the reason I think they put it together is because in some cases, um, it wasn't an outright lie or they couldn't really prove it. But there was, you know, it, <laughs> there was a strong indication or hunch that, you know, they, were, they, they didn't come clean. And so... Um, they put them on that list because if that list is for defense attorneys to be able to go to see, because it's 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 what you call it uh, full transparency. Uh, the last thing you want to do is for a prosecutor to know that a cop wasn't a hundred percent truthful and has a history, and maybe has a history and right. don't tell anybody, and then the defense attorney finds out somehow, and that that that's ugly for everybody. So. Who the hell was this guy, Brady, that the list was named after? I mean, that's just like a, he's living in infamy. <laughs> you know, I should know this, but I, I, I've been away from, uh, from the work for a while, and I don't want to, I don't want to make up what I don't, um, hundred percent remember. Uh, but obviously, mo a lot of these laws, case law comes from cases like Miranda. Right, right, right. Right? Yeah. Was from a guy named Miranda who was arrested and right. he wasn't given his rights and he became infamous for that. Right. And so you're right. Uh, but I don't remember the story. Um, no, I'm just joking. I'm just saying, I mean, yeah. some list you don't want you to be named after right. after you. So, so there's a Brady list. Is this specific to San Diego only? No, I think it's uh, in California, if okay. I'm not mistaken. So... You brought up the Brady list for a reason. Yeah. So there's officers on the Brady list that were caught lying or not being completely truthful, which is a, li a lie to me, right? So I asked you to talk about problems. You said leadership. And then you lie, you cheat, you steal, you should be gone. Yes. Right? Yes. That's not the case. Not always the case. Not always the case. Yeah. Officers can be caught lying, cheating, and stealing, and they're not gone. I think for the most part, the profession um, does do that, does enforce that. Um, the problem is we're not worried about the majority that does the right thing. We're talking about a handful, but it's those handful, just like, you know, there's only like between 1% and maybe as high as 10% of the population that are really, really bad people that need to be in jail. In law enforcement? It, no, in, in, in the population in, in... No, no, no. I agree with you. I agree you know, with you. In yeah. our communities, right. there's only like between 1% and I don't know, 9 or 10% of those career criminals that are our career of you know uh, uh they, they commit crimes all the time and right? they're the ones that cause the problems in our society exactly they're the ones that cause the majority of the problems and if we could deal with those okay 90 percent of that community any community even the poor communities 90 percent or higher 95 percent are good law-abiding hard-working people miguel we've talked about this we have right so so for the sake of argument, well, you and I see eye to eye there, right? Law enforcement it exists to deal with that minority percentage in a community. What exists 
to deal with that minority percentage in the law enforcement community that is causing problems for the profession and terrorizing communities. Who well, so we have to we have cops to deal with that one to eight percent of the of of the general public. Right. What do we have to deal with the one to eight percent of the cops that are the problem? Well, we have uh, most police departments have internal affairs units, and uh, and then other. Uh, in fact, San Diego PD not only had internal affairs, but they also had another unit that was very proactive. In fact, they were their their offices were off site somewhere in a secret location, and what they did was they proactively, either through complaints, through word of mouth, and they heard about a cop um, violating policy, serious policy right. uh, procedures, or criminal. They would they would hone in and surveil and investigate. And and then that unit was disbanded. Why? I think there was some budget issues. But most police departments and sheriff's departments, they really do, uh, they have a, an internal affairs unit to deal with bad cops. Uh, but there's issues. And the issues are officer bill of rights. The issues are a, a police officer associations, um, civil service. Unions. Let's... let's, let's uh... Let me back up a second, but stay with the Bill of Rights because our viewers don't know what you meant, what you mean by the police officer's Bill of Rights here in the state of California. But when you talk about internal affairs, you need to, no problem. Um, you talk about internal affairs. Go to the restroom, and when you come back, I want you to talk to our viewers about those viewers that say, I don't feel comfortable with cops investigating cops. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Where is it? Uh, I'll show you. Sorry about that, bro. Uh, no worries. Not a, not a, not a problem at all. We still rolling? Yeah, yeah. So for those people who are skeptical, like they don't trust law enforcement to begin with, and the analogy I use is: you you got kids, you come home from work, the lamp is broken. And your kids say, we're going to do an investigation about how this lamp got broken. And they come back to you and say, you know what? It's nobody's fault that the lamp got broken. That's law enforcement. 
No fault here. It's almost as if the lamp was, wasn't was broken. And if it was, if it did get broken, it's nobody's fault here. That's how I see internal investigations. And a lot of people see internal investigations that way from the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. You know that cops lose their jobs. You know that cops get fired. You know that cops get rep reprimanded. But the general public doesn't, rarely do we ever hear that a police officer got fired for a policy violation or, or what have you. We hear about the officers that get in. We hear about the Derek Chauvins of the world. Mm -hmm. That's who we hear about. Right. And you ask the question, well, whatever happened to internal investigations to let this guy become the Derek Chauvin that we know now today? So talk to me, talk, talk to us about that, because it seems to me that that is part of the problem, too, when you have a profession that has always been, that always circles the ranks, completely secretive. This is the history of law enforcement. We're, we're, we're better now, mostly. And now we, the people, sit back and watch the government make their own rules to police and protect their own. I feel like that's a problem, too. Yes. Uh, and, you know, whenever there's a perception, um, the community's had that perception Law enforcement has to take a look at that and ask themselves, why does the community have that perception? Okay. Good law enforcement agencies go out to that, those communities and they ask those questions. That chief, those leaders go out to the community and speak to those leaders and to regular people and they ask them, hey, look, man, tell it to me straight. That's community policing. That's community policing. That's the guardian, the three-dimensional cop that I, I've talked to you about, Right is that chief. Those are the kind of chiefs that will change police departments and uh, bring community communities and police departments together, those kind of chiefs. And they're out there. They're out there. But here's part of the problem. And I, I want to share this with you because this is a true story uh, on SDPD because I, I heard it. I heard it firsthand. San Francisco, years, 20, 30 years ago, came up with a... Uh, civilian commission. I forget what they called it. It was a civilian commission. They were outraged at the cops up there and they were able to get um, subpoena power and very powerful. And they could investigate. They could take cases, IA cases, and investigate them and subpoena people. And even, I believe, they, they, they would even come up with the discipline. Right? So it was... In answer to those 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 um, perceptions that the community has that you guys can't police yourselves, we don't trust you. Well, what happens? That commission, none of those people were cops, so they really didn't understand the mind of the cop. They didn't understand why cops think and do what they do. And so sometimes even the police department would 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 complain, man, you let that guy off really really easy. We would have nailed them harder because they didn't really get the gist of what was happening. They didn't, they didn't understand, right? And then in other cases where the cops should have gotten some punishment, they went way overboard. The commission did. The commission did, right? So they were having a problem conducting investigations and then applying the proper discipline that made sense. That was correct for the, you know, whatever the crime was. Or and this is offense. San Francisco. This was San Francisco. But at least this commission had teeth. They did. But the reason I bring that up is not to criticize them. Right. Because, you know, I, I wasn't up there and I don't know all the facts. However, I got to tell you something. And you got to bet that if, if, if this happened in San Diego, it was happening everywhere else. Because chiefs meet all the time and they talk. So I remember hearing sergeants, lieutenants talking to us about it because we kept hearing about that commission. Right. And what did we keep hearing? It, it may come down here. And everybody was afraid of it. And so what the San Diego Police Department did was they geared up and they said, listen, if we 
if we don't get our act together and put together an IA unit that is straight up, high integrity, the best investigators, the best leaders, and we call it as we see it, we do objective investigations and we call it as it as we see it, even if it's painful for people we like, that's going to happen. That was the incentive. And so I, I saw firsthand that SDPD, those lieutenants they put in there, and in our IA, every single investigator in IA was a sergeant. That way, when they called uh, an officer in, it was a higher rank interviewing them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So um, they were all sergeants and lieutenant and a lieutenant in charge with uh, uh, reporting directly to a chief, an assistant chief, executive chief. And, and that chief was briefed once a week on cases. Um, so, I mean, they were so hard that I tell you what, man, there were a lot of people who didn't want to go to IA because they didn't want to be hated. The cops didn't like it because they got called in and they got, they got put on the, on, you know, on the hot stove, but it had to be done. We're accountable. We're, we're civil servants. We're, we're accountable. And if you don't have anything to hide, then come clean. It's interesting because here in Los Angeles, uh, I know the office of the inspector general. His name is Mark. He's a good guy. He's got no teeth. Mm -hmm. um, all he can do is make recommendations based on the investigation that they've done. Mm -hmm. And then the chief of police has the final decision. And I personally am not in favor of, of giving anybody unilateral authority, whether it's the chief or the district attorney. It's too much power, right? So you've, you've shared some of the problems inside of law enforcement. It's important for me to give you the time to talk about your three-dimensional policing model because it offers a a model solution to many of the problems that exist inside of the profession. So explain to our viewers what that is. So it's, it's, we call it 3d because at the time that I put it together, um, you know, the TV industry was, was bringing back 3d. Remember that just a couple of years ago, they were coming back with 3d TVs and that was the big thing. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. died down yeah, since. Yeah. So, um, originally it was called, you know, the three levels of leadership that have to follow each other. They got to be, they got to work together in order for a good law enforcement leader to be effective. And so it's, it's very simple. It's three things you got to be. And that's why I'm telling you, not everybody can be a cop because not everybody can do this. So we have to get away from the old military style academy where it doesn't matter if you are 21 when you come through the academy or 31 because there's no age limit or 41 with tons of experience. The attitude is you're a rookie. Shut up. Learn. You don't have no value to give us. We're going to teach you everything. How crazy is that? Okay. Yeah. When you go through the academy, you need to chill out and listen to what's going on and learn because you're learning a new profession, right? No problem with that. But when you graduate and you go through field training and you're done with that, you know, if you've, if you're a mature person with, you know, experience in the military, 20 year career or an industry or whatever, you're bringing some value. You have something to offer. Yeah. yeah. You're not a rookie. Right. You know, uh, you're a rookie in police work, but you're not a rookie in life. In life. Yeah. So the way we see this is in the academy, we got to start teaching brand new no officers don't worry about it we got to teach young officers every officer a leader which is a departure from what we used to do which was you're a recruit you're a rookie shut up learn you have no value because you're a you're a one cell amoeba <laughs> until <laughs> we teach you and indoctrinate you in the culture so instead okay 
we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We keep some of the, those things that we've always traditionally done in police work, the things that are uh, add value, but we throw away some of that militaristic crap that has no no place in modern police work. And every officer or leader from day one, from day one, every officer or leader. And you know why? Because when we say you're a leader, all of a sudden what we do is we up the responsibility right. and expectations, right? Because leader, tell the truth. Leaders, uh, role model, good things. Leader, do the right thing when nobody's watching. Leaders uh, are trainers. Leaders are team players. They help, you know, one guy falls, you're a leader. You help him. It's not every man for himself. Right. Right? So we, we do that premise in the academy, which I think would be huge. It would change a, a lot of the things that... Uh, we do in police work for the better. So that's step one of three. Well, that's just even before we get to the three. Okay. So here's the three. We start there because that's a big cultural change because we're still doing academy, military, rah, rah, rah. Right. Okay. There's a place for some of that. Okay. To bring teams together, to let people know that, you know, you're not an individual anymore. Um, and and it, it gets into what I'm going to talk about. So it's three three things. It's, think about leader, warrior, guardian, okay, and teacher. So here's how it works. If every officer is a leader, from day one that you're in the field, you have that leadership mentality in your head. But you have to transition because even as a captain or a chief, I I went from um, uh, telling people what to do and leading to... Now I got to listen and learn because you can't be a leader 724, okay? If I walk into a room of uh, a bunch of prosecuting lawyers, they're the experts in that field. Right. I'm not a leader in that field. Right. Okay? And that happened to me a lot in the DA's office. So it's a transition back and forth. You're a leader one moment and you're a listener and a follower the next, okay? You're, You're a student. You're a student, an ongoing learner. Right. Yes. Always learning, always learning and not being uh, defensive when you need to listen. Okay. That rookie officer that you have no clue could be a PhD that decided he was done doing that and he wants to be a public servant. And that happens in police work. Pilots, all kinds of highly qualified people. But what do we do? Everybody's a rookie. Everybody is is, is a snot-nosed you know, know nothing. And I think we lose a lot when we do that. So that's the first thing is leader, which oversees everything. And then you have the warrior guardian because here's my question. Remember the West Hollywood big shootout? Yeah. With those two scary guys with the body armor and shooting those automatic weapons. If you call the cops under fire like that as a civilian, what kind of cop do you want to respond and what do you want that cop to do? To stop the threat. Yes. And only a warrior, guardian, trained and equipped, the right attitude is going to do that. Right? However, that guardian warrior doesn't need to be in that mode 100% of the time. And that's what makes it difficult, is that for that less than 1% of the time in your whole career that you have to go warrior mode, and it could be a couple times a night, Right. One night, and then you could go the next week and a half and not be in warrior mode. You could go the next 10 years. Yes, yes. But here's the point. You got to be able to transition back and forth. From guardian, do you know that in Puerto Rico, the cops are called guardias? Guardias. And this is back dating in the 1800s. Guardias. Okay, because they're guardians of the community. And that's the attitude. But we need the warrior too. And he's got to be trained and equipped. He or she. Right, right, right. right, right. But you got to transition back and forth. Well, but that's part of the problem too, Miguel, because most of your training prepares you to be in warrior mode. Yes. it. They talk about transitioning, but... Again, not enough people are reinforcing that all the time. Right, but I'm saying if you spend 90% of your time in, in guardian mode 
and yet 90% of your training is to be in warrior mode, the, 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 the paradigm is upside down. No doubt. No, and it is a paradigm. This training is a paradigm shift. Okay. So great point, because this means changing the academy for the, uh, the leader, every officer leader, changing the training to make sure that we break down by percentage, you know, what it is likely you're going to be spending the percentage of your time doing. Have more balance. Yeah, more balance, exactly. More realistic right. balance, right? So then you have the leader again, recapping leader, guardian warrior, and then the other component is teacher. Teacher. Why? Because our job, we don't, we enforce laws, okay? We don't punish. That's the courts. Some cops are in punish mode. When they see, you know, they get into a chase with a guy or they get into a fight and the guy takes a swing and hits the, uh, his partner. You know, you cuff that guy, it's you're done. Okay? Court time. DA and the courts now take over. You're not a punisher. You're not a punisher. But one thing we do a lot is we stop people for speeding. We stop people for traffic violations. We interact with a, a, a DV, a domestic violence victim or a victim of another crime, okay? So in that case, you're a care worker and you're also a teacher. You're educating people. The guy you stop for speeding, why is he always got to get a ticket? You stop, you stop him for speeding at two o'clock in the morning. There's nobody on the road. He hasn't been drinking, okay? He's a working guy who's working really hard. You could see he's a working guy, okay? He can't afford a $200, $300 ticket. Do you think you could get more out of talking to that guy for a minute and saying, let me ask you something. What do you do for a living? Oh, you know, I'm a bricklayer or whatever. Okay. You check his record too, because you want to verify, right? Right. Okay. The guy hasn't had a ticket. Okay. Now, if he's got a dozen tickets for the same thing, then he needs to be handled. Okay. But if he's a clean guy, clean record, I think you get more out of walking up to that guy or telling him to step out of the car up on the sidewalk and saying, hey man, I can see you're a hardworking dude, man. I'm not going to give you this $300 ticket, but I stopped you because when you speed like this, you put other people in danger, including yourself. Do you want to kill a family of four or five because you're speeding? Let me ask you a question. Do I have to give you a ticket to get this across or will you respect what I'm saying and take some value from this and not speed again? Okay. Most people are going to say, no, no, I appreciate it. And most people are going to drive away. And guess what's going to be the topic of what happened at the dinner table where your kids right. are listening? Right. Okay. Right. Is that, you know what? These cops ain't bad people. They're out here doing their job. Word travels either way. Yes. Yes. Right. Or you can choose to, you know, not think it through. Write the guy a ticket because you're doing your job. Right. 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 You're doing your job. He violated the law. He was speeding, and I'm going to give him a ticket. There's been all kinds of accidents and blah, blah, blah. You leave out the part that he never got stopped for speeding, right? You kind of whitewash that. You, you don't remember that. You don't want to talk about that because you were intent on giving him the ticket. So guess what? That topic at the dinner table, instead of that cop was doing the right thing, and I think these guys are honorable people, it's these cops are assholes. Right. These cops don't care. These cops are no compassion. These cops don't like us, blah, blah, blah. Whatever they want to make up. And guess who's listening? Kids. And they're being influenced. Okay. How many times has that happened in our communities? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's those three things. Every officer leader, warrior mm. guardian, teacher. Well, you know what you just described in order to be a teacher, there needs to be, in order to be a good teacher, you just described a, a human element. Like you, you, you care about this person moving forward and what they're going to do or not do after this interaction that you just had with them. Hopefully you got through and they, and they won't speed. And then there are some cases where you need to write that ticket. Absolutely. It's also how you write that ticket. Yes, sure. Right? Sure. So if you're going to be if you're going to be a teacher, you know, I remember my best teachers. I also remember my worst teachers. Yes. 
I was just thinking about one of my worst teachers in grad school last night. What were some of the things you remember? Because you know what you remember? You remember the things that hurt you and you felt or the, unfair. Or the, or the things that brought me joy. So, so about the bad teacher, what were some of the things about that person, their behavior or whatever they said that you never forget? He's a liar. Okay. Right? Yeah. We, we talked about that earlier. Um, wasn't a person of character. And he didn't take his job seriously. He wasn't a professional. No, he was tenured. So he had a guarantee. Didn't give a rat's ass. Right. right. People complained about him all the time. And too many police officers are tenured. We have civil service and that civil service and sometimes the association prevent chiefs from doing what they need to do. So I'm glad you brought that up because that was something that I wanted to talk about, that those are things that are in place that we have no control over. A chief does not have control over. And let me tell you, I don't, you don't know how many people we wanted to let go, but because of civil service and in some cases, not all cases, the association also chiming in, it was difficult. It was yeah. very difficult to, to, to get rid of people. So, so that's not part of your, your three dimensional policing model. Um, that deals with the officer, right? The type of officers that you want to create, right? Yes. But it starts with the recruiting, right? Right, right, right. Imagine if we recruited and we laid that out. These, this, if you, if you can do these things, then we want you. We want you. If you're the kind of person that leadership fascinates you, some of your role models were great leaders. They told the truth. They were ethical. They had character. They, they, they were teachers and coaches. They were selfless. People came first before them. If that excites you, you're a leader. Yeah, but you can't catch everybody. You know, there are people you're, who are no, going to no, lie gonna, and say, yeah, I want to do all that. But that'll scare. And, and you know, that'll scare. Some people that'll say, well, no, I, I, that's not me. I, I, I don't want to be part of that. Right. You know, I don't want to be part true, of that. True. And it raises the, the expectations and the standards. And if you can't do that, the academy is going to have to be changed, right? The way we train people, the field training is going to have to be changed so that that's incorporated into the evaluation process. Is this person having a, a, a problem? Um, transitioning between leader and guardian or warrior and teacher, or are they stuck a hundred percent in warrior mode? Right. Okay. Which will burn you out in a heartbeat. That's why I believe the cops who want to be in warrior mode, everybody's the enemy. Everybody's going to kill me is the person who burns out and stress out and have behavior problems and performance problems. We see it all the time. Right. You know? Right. So, and you know, and when you teach this, you can, you can talk about that. You know, you cannot be 100% on red alert, okay? You're a warrior only less than 1% of the time in your career, 1%. Right. But here's what makes it tough. You got to be ready because for that 1%, you got to be ready physically, mentally, spiritually. Right. You know, you got to be able to shoot right, defend yourself right. With your hands, with the tools you have, you know, use all, only that force necessary. It's heavy. So you can get home to your family. Yeah. Right. But imagine, imagine if you go to the range all the time, and I have the experience with SWAT. We used to shoot all the time, shoot, 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 rappel, run. And, you know, the call outs weren't that many. Right, right. Right? And there comes a time when you're going, man, all this work, all this work, and we hardly get called out. And then when we get called out, you know, we're sitting there for eight hours negotiators are negotiating, you know, you're a SWAT officer. You want to go in there and take care of business, right? It's not necessarily to kill people because, you know, our thing was always, you know, SWAT is about saving lives, really. It didn't have to be kill them. It means, you know, gassing them, going in and taking them into custody, right. you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I didn't know one guy, to be honest with you, Sean, either in police work or in SWAT. I never heard one guy say, man, I can't wait to put a bullet in somebody. I, I didn't. Maybe somebody else did. I didn't. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because if it was the other way around, I'd be straight up about it. Right. Just like I've been with everything else. Right. You know. But I, I never and if they might have been, I'm not gonna say that there might not have been a couple of jerks that maybe felt that way, because they had something wrong with them and they passed the psych somehow. Right. But you know, they knew they knew the culture of our department that don't even say that. You know, because if somebody runs upstairs and says they heard that, you know, they're gonna be watching you. You know, and then you got a lot of explaining to do if the next day you get into a shooting that's questionable and you had made the statement. So, yeah. Miguel, thank you. Thank you for coming and spending some time to talk about your career, what you see inside of law enforcement that needs to be fixed, and then offering, offering solutions to improve the profession. I mean, you spent enough time in the profession. Um, your words really are needed in this particular point in our nation's history. Uh, can't thank you enough for, for making the time. I know you got to get back on the road. Sean, I'm here. I'm here for two reasons. I'm here because ever since I met you, how long was it? About eight years ago? It might have been longer than that because we met a while. Uh, uh, Even before. We met a long time ago. And then didn't see each other for, for years. years. And then true. when I created Game Changer, that's when we came back together. That's right. You're right. I forgot about that. Father Henry Rodriguez. That's right. That's right. God bless us all. Um, so when you put when when I met you and I uh, we were talking about you getting this going, this game changer concept. Right. I remember thinking, I admired you then because I remember thinking, um, this guy has got something here. Not only that, the the goal, the mission of this program is is great, and and it we need this now more than ever. And then, lo and behold, what happens? This was eight years ago, and then it got even worse. Right, right, right. It got even worse, and I remember. Through all those, the last couple of years with uh, the Louisiana thing and a bunch of other things right. all over the nation with the shooting of uh, African Americans and uh, the, the 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 violence and the riots, I remember always thinking about, man, Sean was right on with this game changer thing, bringing sports and law enforcement and the community together. So I admire that. Uh, so I admire the mission and the goal of this program. But I also respect what you're doing because this is hard work. I, hey, man, I, I appreciate it. I, re, I really do. And, and we'll have to um, carve out some more time to talk. Um, just really great to have you on Cops and Convicts, man. I, I really appreciate you coming. And, and to, to our, our viewers, once again, please make sure you subscribe. Um, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. We're going to make multiple clips. Of, of our time here together. So uh, I'll be looking forward to getting that out. But Miguel, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, bro. Salud. You're welcome. Salud. Keep it going, man. Yes, sir. Keep it going, Sean. No doubt. Thank you. Yep.